Thank you again. As I consider my own thankfulness for this area of service, I couldn't help but be struck by the need which necessitates that we have a military, the need which necessitates that we have veterans, the need which necessitates these realities. And to be clear, that need is violence and war. It is a sad reality, but it is a reality nonetheless. Terrorism, wars, conflicts, they're in the news constantly. Of course, as we look around, we can see what we would describe maybe more as a natural disaster or catastrophe that happens. I was going through some of the, the most destructive or devastating ones of the 21st century, and uh, they're ones that probably... Most of us have forgotten about in some ways, and some might stand out more to us. I just want to read a few of them, and, and I think this will make more sense as we get into our time in the Word. But I want to consider these areas. Think about this. In 2003, we had the European heat wave. I don't remember this very well, but the death toll was more than 70,000 in Europe. In 2004, we had the Indian Ocean Tsunami. On the first day of this, more than 150,000 people were killed and millions more were missing in this disaster that came. In 2005, there was the Kashmir earthquake. The figures estimate that 100,000 people died and more than 70,000 were injured and more than 4 million became homeless. The 2010 earthquake in Haiti, of which we are more familiar with in many ways, having served in a variety of capacities. In this earthquake, there were 220,000 casualties, more than 300,000 injuries, and more than 3 million people became homeless in about 18 seconds. In 2005, here in our country, Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana and Mississippi, Approximately 1,833 people died in this hurricane and the ensuing floods, and the natural disaster caused more than $100 billion in property damage. Interestingly enough, as I thought about this, maybe the more up-close view, having gone to Haiti directly after the earthquake, I remember arriving at the airport and seeing the airport was itself damaged significantly. And as we went through... I can remember going past the government building where the elite of the nation of Haiti resided, worked, and, and, and were a part of. And it was a rubble pile with bodies still visible in it. In other words, these cat catastrophes, these disasters, we see both the wealthy and those who are poor with their lives ripped apart. They're, they're not a respecter of persons. They affect Everyone, there's no way to have lived in Haiti in 2010 in the Port-au-Prince area and not have been affected. It doesn't matter your financial state. It doesn't matter your preparedness. It just doesn't matter when these things happen. And even though we see the helplessness that we have in it, there is constant conversation and efforts to make these sort of things never happen again. We're going to build up the dams and the dikes in the Louisiana area. We're going to do this, and, and we're going to somehow do all that we can to prevent these catastrophes from happening. Even those that are not natural. After World War II, men formed coalitions and treaties and all of these United Nations and other things coming together to say that these things must never happen again. As near as I can tell, with the limited resources I have available to me, since World War II, right at 100,000 U.S. servicemen and women have died in violent conflict. Right at 100,000 since World War II, since the formation of coalitions and since the desire for these things to never happen. That's American servicemen and women. It's not any of the conflicts that are going on outside of uh, those that involve our citizens. And so what I want to say is even as we put in all of these efforts, even as we have all of these grand designs and desires that these things must never happen, I, I want to say with clarity, they always happen again. We certainly can see that. And this is what we come to realize in this, and, and, and this is the point of this morning, wealth 
is fleeting, security is an illusion, and life is short. Those are the realities that these types of things constantly point us to. And this is where I want us to understand about this. There are only two schools of thought. We can have all kinds of variations, but they come down to truly, there's only two schools of thought when confronted with these realities and truths. Life is short and the world is uncertain, so eat, drink, and be merry because this is all there is. That's one school of thought. And certainly we see people pursuing that. It, it is what it is. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. Therefore, I'm going to get all I can from this life for whatever season I have it. The other one is life is short and this world is uncertain, so labor to live for more than the shortness and uncertainty that surrounds us. In this text that we're in this morning in Matthew 19, we have a man who comes to Jesus recognizing these realities. But what he's trying to do is he tries to merge them and Jesus quickly shows you can't do this. You can't have a this is all there is, eat, drink, and be merry because it is short and it is uncertain. And then merge that somehow with, but I also want to live for something more. In other words, I hate to break this to you, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. And in our text today, Jesus clearly lays this out as it pertains to the gospel. As it pertains to eternal life. Read with me in this account. We're only going to make it to verse 22 this morning. It does continue on as Jesus gives greater commentary on what we're going to see this morning. But for this morning, we're going to go from verse 16 of chapter 19 in Matthew's gospel to verse 22. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not, shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Verse 22, but when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. Now, this is a well-known account. It's oftentimes labeled the account of the rich young ruler. This comes from the harmony of both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of them contain this account with a few additional things in it. And what I think we have here and what we're going to look at this morning is that our Lord has just given us a 3D understanding of the gospel. What we have here is evangelism according to Jesus and that's an important thing. And I think the most noticeable thing at first glance to me is the way that it contradicts most modern gospel presentations. It is a contradiction of the modern view of evangelism, which someone had said to me that they heard that or thought this passage was controversial. I had never really thought it to be until I began to study more into it and realize, oh, it's controversial because it contradicts all that we oftentimes practice. Think in terms of this account in our modern day. A man comes and asks us, what must he do to have eternal life? The first thing that we would do is we would be amazed that they asked and feel like most of our work is already done. They're convinced that they need eternal life and I have the answer. We would maybe ask two probing questions, but probably not because they're already primed. We don't need to get them there. They're there. We would then call them to accept Jesus we would pronounce them upon having done that to be saved. Then we would give them a spiritual gift test and put them to service as quickly as possible. Everything our Lord does here contradicts our modern understanding of evangelism. It's amazing how our Lord doesn't do that. On the surface, as a matter of fact, he seems to talk the man out of following him. He then asks something we would never ask of the man because we know that it will blow the deal as it does, and on top of that, it seems as though Jesus maybe just added works to our salvation. He then lets him get away. 
He doesn't call him back and say, hold on, hold on, like his car salesman, I can give you a little better deal. I don't want you to leave. And then on top of that, he uses him as an example to his disciples. Man, Jesus really messed this up. That's what we're confronted with. We, we have to either believe Jesus really messed this up or we have to recognize that we're really messing it up. That's where we're at with this text. And so, yes, there is controversy because of that reality. We don't have the ability to look at this and say, that's how we're doing it. But we should. Let's look at what he actually does. And I love this because in this, what we have is the reality of our Lord's presentation of the gospel. How can a man be saved? How can a man have eternal life? As Job expressed in chapter 9, how can a man who is a sinner be right with a God who is holy? How can that be done? And in this, what I want us to see is that our Lord presents the gospel with the key components that never change, but he is dealing with a young man who is high up in the Jewish community. He has a position of authority and stature and prominence, which means that this is a man well-versed in religious realities concerning Judaism and orthodoxy in that. And so our Lord begins very specifically, very succinctly in that. Let's look at how he actually does it. We'll look at, I'm going to read from all three accounts, Matthew 19 and verse 16, we just read it, Mark 10 and verse 17, and Luke 18 and verse 18, at this very first sentence describing this young man. In verse 16 of Matthew, and someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Now Mark gives us a little more detail. He says, as he, being Christ, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt down before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Luke gives us just a little bit more when he says this in verse 18 of chapter 18, a ruler question him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So, so here what we have is a young man who came up to him seeking him. Mark says that he was both enthusiastic and extremely respectful and humble. He came running up to the Lord and knelt down or bowed down before him. Luke describes him as one who is a ruler within the nation. So in this first verse, we see a noble and sincere young man of some position and stature come humbly and respectfully, respectfully before Jesus with a sincere question. He was not, as the Pharisees earlier in the chapter, trying to test or trap our Lord. He sincerely, recognizing something lacking, came to the Lord asking him the question of, how do I receive what I know to be lacking? Now, all of this is good at this point, to a degree. I mean, think about this. How much should our heart leap when any man would ask about the way unto eternal life? However, our Lord perceives something about this man, as we shall see. And I want to pause here for a moment, because I hear folks say, well, this is because Jesus knows the heart of man, that which is in it. As we've seen throughout our time that he hears the thoughts of men as the Pharisees were thinking or speaking among themselves at a distance and the Lord perceiving their minds address that. We see in John 2 that he did not entrust himself to the crowds because he himself knew what was in their heart and didn't need anyone to teach him. I understand that our Lord is divine. I understand that his deity did carry over into his humanity. However... This is not an excuse for our lack of this to lead us into foolish evangelism. We have to think better about this. When a sincere question is asked of us in regards to our faith, we must give an equally sincere answer from the fullness of what we do know and are able to perceive. Here's what I mean by that. We know that all men are dead and their trespasses and sins before they're converted. We know that. That never changes. It does not change due to outward appearance of nobility, eagerness, nor sincerity. That never changes. We know that all men are dead in their trespasses and sins. None of this ever changed. And so this was a sincere and respectful young man 
who was fairly self-assured, but Jesus knows, and so do we, that this is a young man who was dead internally, spiritually, in his own trespasses and sins. And this led to Jesus asking what is a necessary question. We don't have to have divine perception in order to be righteous in our evangelism. Jesus did not ask this question simply because he knew that this young man had this struggle that we see a little later in the text. I don't agree with that. I believe Jesus knew that. Yes, he is divine. Yes, he is able to perceive that which is in the heart of men. Yes, he did know those things. But I don't think that we're without that ability as it pertains to righteous evangelism. Listen to Jesus' response. He said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. So this seems like a strange response. To be honest, you and I probably would not say it quite this way. But remember, Jesus was dealing with a Jewish man. This did not take his divinity to perceive that. He knew who he was. He understood that. This is a Jewish young man. A ruler, meaning that he was a young man of stature and importance in the Jewish community. One commentator said that likely he would have been somewhat of a clerk to the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling council within the Jewish community. But very much so, we know that he was religiously respected. And therefore, with Jewish culture being what it is, he had extensive knowledge of God, or he would not have held this title and position that he held. And so what Jesus does here in verse 17 is he does what is always necessary. This is the foundation of evangelism. He reminds them of God's holiness. He reminds them that God is holy. Therefore, recognize in that, recon- or in that reminder that this young man is subject to God's standards. If this young man does not realize there is only one who is truly good, meaning he can do no good thing to earn eternal life, that he cannot measure up, he has to be called to a reminder, a recognition of God's holiness. It's an important reality and no gospel presentation can lack it. No gospel, no true evangelism can ever jump over God's holiness And Jesus certainly does not hear. His immediate response to this young man is, there's only one who is good. That's going to inform everything else I tell you. You need to be reminded up front, there's only one who is good. And with your background, I know that you know this to some degree. This is the starting point for a discussion about receiving eternal life, which is a gift from God. He, He doesn't skip it. This is so important. We need to understand this about our evangelism. Man must have a rightly established view of God's holiness because this is what will allow him to recognize that he is subject to God's standards and they are different than his. They are greater than his. They are beyond his. And so we need to understand that he must begin by recognizing God is holy. Therefore, when we get to the part of understanding how do you get to eternal life through the standards God has established must be the beginning or else this person, whoever it may be, will never submit themselves to God's will. You must establish a right view of God before there can be any further discussion about meeting God's standards. Now, here's some examples that we deal with quite frequently. If a person comes thinking that their view of God is of a benevolent, grandfatherly type who is disinterested in details and only wants to bless them, then what we have to establish in that person's life is the reality of God's holiness and justice. Now, on the flip side, if a man comes just viewing God as wrathful and judgmental, then we need to establish in his life the grace and mercy of God before him. Not that we negate the other, we maintain both. Yes, God wants to bless you. Yes, God is compassionate. Yes, God has loved you. But here's the other component of his character that he will not lay down because of that. And yes, God is wrathful. Yes, the wrath of God abides upon unrighteousness, upon which we all are. Yes, he will judge and is appointed a day upon which that will accomplish. Yes, but he is also given grace and mercy through his compassion and love. There has to be a total establishment of who God is at the beginning of any evangelistic endeavor. Listen, 
a right view of God is the essential starting point for any gospel conversation. Now, now I need to take a quick hermeneutical side point, just for a moment. There's a lot of things that I found to be controversial in this that should not be. This is a very short account. This is a very succinct account that's been given to us in the gospel. I just want to think about this. There is rarely, if ever, a complete transcript of all parts of Jesus' words and conversations and teachings or actions anywhere. And guys, this is for a good reason. John alludes to it in, in the Gospel of John at the conclusion when he said, there's not enough pages in the world to contain all the accounts of Christ. But I want us to really think about that for a minute because the controversy comes in and, well, this seems incomplete. This seems short. This seems to be lacking in. And I wonder why Jesus didn't say this. I want to be clear. We, we don't know that he didn't. But there are some reasons why it's not recorded here. Number one, there's not enough room. There's no way to record. I just want you to think about this. I tried to think about this and it takes some subjectivity. But there's 365 days in a year. Let's subtract 52 Sabbaths from that. So if you take that, 365 minus 52, multiply it times 3, since the basic life of Christ's earthly ministry was 3 years, and then you figure 15 hours a day of vigorous ministry, we would have about 14,000 plus hours of life spent in vigorous, detailed ministry. I don't know how many people Jesus could heal in an hour. I don't know how much truth he could lay out in an hour. I don't know how much falsehood he could confront in an hour. I don't know how much evangelistic realities he could present in an hour. But if you think of it in that term and basically just think of 15 hours a day, 14,000 hours spent in three years, then I know this, three pages for every hour would result in more than 50,000 pages of detailed accounts per gospel, rather than the 50-page average we have for Matthew now. We struggle enough. Our Lord was gracious to not give us 50,000 plus pages per gospel account. So understand, in this account, it is succinct. We don't know if there was more conversation, but we know that we were given what we need The second thing that I would point out about why it should not be controversial about what is not said here is because this is true. If something is said once in Scripture, it's resolute. How many times does Jesus have to say something for it to be true? I'll give you a hint. One. One. It doesn't have to be repeated every time. Meaning this. Jesus can presume upon his earlier statements as standing clear and firm, as they have been brought to the authors by the Holy Spirit and recorded and preserved by his power for us today. Here's what I mean. As we read this address, we probably are not given every word of the discussion, but it is likely a very abbreviated form because of room and time constraints, but also because Jesus has already addressed for us to know that God's holiness is the standard. You say, well, why does he just give it to, why does he say it that way? Because that was what was necessary to bring this young Jewish ruler to the point of remembrance that God is holy. And Jesus, for our hearts, has already addressed God's standard based upon his holiness for salvation. It came in Matthew 5. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, and in that he began with the Beatitudes. Remember, blessed are those who are poor in spirit who recognize their own inability to accomplish spiritual things for theirs is the kingdom of heaven theirs is eternal life he goes on and in the course of that in verse 20 he tells us this concerning the holiness of God and the standard of God of Matthew chapter 5 for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees you will not enter the kingdom of heaven and the other bookend of that in Matthew 5 is verse 48 therefore You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
In other words, the fact that it's not recorded in the totality of the gospel presentation that was brought forth to this rich young ruler does not negate the realities of that. Jesus is not contradicting Matthew 5. He is presuming upon the fact that it's already recorded, that we already know this truth. Therefore, we should not look at it and say, well, we have to do it just like this and negate chapter 5. As believers, we take the whole counsel of God and we apply it to our entire lives. So just a little hermeneutical break there for you to recognize this. When you're studying God's word, you need to take into account all of it. Do not read this account and then say, well, this is different than or does not include what I thought was true about the gospel or about evangelism that we saw in chapter 5. You, in your study and wisdom, bring chapter 5, connect it to chapter 19, and have the whole counsel of God driving all of our actions. Here our Lord simply calls this fellow to the recognition of God's holiness. Every gospel presentation must have this in his standards as the beginning point of eternal life. In Matthew, assuming upon the readers already having known this, because he is already recording Jesus on it, is perfectly natural. And that makes sense to me. If I'm telling you a story, I don't have to keep telling you every single detail as we get further into it. If I've told you this, and if you have a question, of course you can ask, but there's a point where I don't feel the need to keep repeating to you every single detail that I've already told you at the beginning of our conversation. It's the same thing. We must not assume upon this text that we do not see and then make it contradict what we already know. Jesus may have shared in more detail with this young man, and Matthew didn't record it because he has already recorded it. Or it could be that this young man, due to Jewish culture and his stature, it may have been proper to simply assume that he knew of God's holiness and the statement was sufficient to remind him of it. What we do know is that here Christ called him to be reminded there's only one who is good. There's only one, and that is God himself. That's the point of this verse. We know that God's holiness is the standard of his judgment. And any man that wants to avoid his condemnation or to have eternal life has to recognize that first. What we know is that. So we don't have to know the heart of a man. We do have to know that every man who is not yet converted is a man who is dead in his trespasses and sins. And the beginning point of him being one who inherits eternal life is establishing in his life the standard of God, which is holiness. We don't need special insight. We need faithfulness to the gospel that we've been given. And by the way, when it comes to those things, I think it's right for the Holy Spirit through the authors of Scripture to presume upon what's been written, to presume upon his people pursuing after it like the pure spiritual milk and the hunger and thirst for righteousness that we're called to have. He gave this to us on the backs of his apostles and through the blood of many martyrs he has preserved it that we might have it today. We must never presume upon nor take for granted the gift that's given and we must never think that we're going to stand before the Lord and say, but I didn't know because he will say, why did you not know? Because I gave you the knowledge. We are those who must pursue that. So a little side note that I think is important for our understanding of study, both the importance and weight of it and the ways to do it. Our Lord's next statement causes no lack of consternation either, but it really shouldn't. It is just the natural continuation of what we know about the gospel. We already know this. He he says this, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Right away, there's this big discussion that breaks out. Is Jesus adding, you know, works to salvation? Is this this Jesus going Catholic? Is this a picture of of Jesus taking and saying, yeah, you, you don't just receive eternal life as a gift. You now also have to work for it and do this. No. Of course not. And let's look at this and understand. He simply says to the man, if you want to gain eternal life by your good deeds, by your virtue and pursuit, then you can. You just have to keep the law. Did you guys hear that? I want you to hear that. If any man is able to keep the law in perfection, he does not need the gospel. 
This is a true statement. It is not a false statement. It is not wrong. It is not untrue. If any man is able to keep the law in perfection or holiness, he does not need the gospel. And so when Jesus says to the young man, you just have to keep the commandments, it's not a wrong statement. Listen, you just have to keep the law. This is true about man's condition. Think about this for just a moment. We're going to get a little deep in some theological things because we need to to understand this, and we should be able to. The Jews had been given the law through Moses, and it carried with it innately the understanding of man's inability bound up in the sacrificial system. Here's the law. Do this, and you will live. But they couldn't do it. No man could do it. And so there was a constant flow of blood out of the temple. There was a constant reminder to every man, woman, and child of the Jewish nation, I can't keep the law. I can't keep the commandments. I can't do this. Just if you will pause for a moment, we're so far removed from this, but I was sharing with a parent this morning, imagine, imagine if your young 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12-year-old were to have to raise up an animal and then because of their sin, their deceitfulness, their rebellion against mom and dad, their dishonor, whatever it is that they have done, they have to take that animal, be it that dove or that goat or that lamb or that rabbit or whatever it is, and they have to go to the temple. And because they sinned, they have to see that animal slaughtered and blood shed because they did that. You think that'll leave an impression? I'm pretty sure there's an impression left from that. And so when Jesus speaks to a young man of the Jewish community, he can speak with a recognition of, you know this. You've been killing animals for years because you can't keep the law. So when he says to him, you just have to keep the law, we have to understand this rightly. <clears throat> we have to recognize it. There's a response the Lord's looking for here. And he doesn't get it, as we know. But this is the reality. There is no deceit in Jesus' words. We will be judged according to the law of God. Jesus says with absolute clarity that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. When we stand before God in judgment, and all of us will, it's a two-phase judgment. The first phase of judgment is he judges us according to his law. And any who do not keep it perfectly will be those who are condemned condemned this is the beauty of Romans 8 and verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus it's this amazing picture of grace and salvation and so what we need to understand is that this is the first phase of judgment condemned or not condemned and the only measurement is did you keep the law perfectly a little hint the answer is always no the answer is always no. None of us are able to keep the law perfectly. In the Jewish community and nation, certainly after 2,500 plus years of failure under the law, should recognize this. <clears throat> no man has nor can keep the law perfectly. And so Jesus came and kept it for us. This is the gospel. Jesus came and kept it for us. And so all who stand in judgment and are in Christ Jesus, when God looks upon them in judgment, judging them according to the standard of his law, he sees his son's righteousness and they are justified and not condemned. This is the gospel. It's not that difficult to comprehend in the understanding. It is impossible to comprehend in our own recognition. The commandments were not given as a means of salvation but rather as a teacher to lead men to the Messiah who brings salvation <clears throat> through the one who does in fact and did in fact keep the law perfectly. Jesus bore the full weight of the law yet without sin. He did that. And then he took that righteousness that he earned and he gave it as a gift to you and I who could not earn it. The commandments were not given as a means of salvation. They were given as a means to point us to salvation. This is gospel 101. 
This is Gospel 101, and we're so far removed because we want to adapt ourselves to the culture and the busyness and other things, so we shorten and we shrink, and we give the attention span the reign it should never have. And instead of doing with faithfulness, we adapt the Gospel to a point where now everyone lives confused about it. And so we have controversy over something that's so simple, and it should not bring that. Listen to Paul's commentary to the Galatian church in the midst of their controversy. Having been those who had heard and trusted the gospel, and now some who were Judaizers, or as Paul calls them in Philippians, mutilators of the flesh, they were coming and bringing law back to bear on those who had been set free from it. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 3, verses 21 down to 27. Chapters 3 and 4 are predominantly all about this. I'm just taking a small section because of time constraints. Paul says this, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. This idea that somehow the law has been negated by Christ is a wrong view. It has been fulfilled by Christ so that all who are in Christ will stand righteous when they are judged according to the law. All those who are not in Christ and stand according to their own righteousness before a holy judge will be consumed and cast into an eternal hell during that or because of that. Is the law contrary? No, may it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. All Paul's saying is the law is not contrary, but no man can keep it. Therefore, the law never has brought life to anyone through the keeping of it because no man can keep it. Verse 22, he explains what the law does accomplish. The scripture, excuse me, has shut up everyone under sin. This doesn't mean it's closed their mouth. It means it's closed the door on them. We're all in the same room, y'all. Every single one of us, all have fallen short, all are sinners, All of us, there are none who are righteous on our own. This is Romans 3. And in Galatians, he's reminding them the scripture, the law has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Until Christ came, the law was not fulfilled. It was a constant labor of sacrifice to withhold the wrath of God that men righteously deserved in their breaking of the law. They were kept in custody under it, being shut up to the faith which is later to be revealed. Listen to verse 24. Here's the key. Therefore the law has become our tutor, our our teacher, to lead us to Christ. This is what the young man was missing. He wanted to come and do it on his own. And Jesus says, no, you, it's pointing you to me. You came to the right place, but you came with the wrong mindset. It has become a tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. This is an important aspect too. I would say this to you. Christ fulfilled the law. There's a lot of questions that come up. What about this? What about the Sabbath? What about this? What about that? Christ fulfilled the law. Christ fulfilled all of the law, but he did not leave us without a law. He gave us a new law, a law of love, the perfect law, James calls it, and it's written on the pages of the New Testament with absolute clarity so that we might know what is God's standard for those who are his citizens. And he summarizes it here for this young man. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in Christ or with Christ. Listen, the law is good. And that it has shut up every man under sin so that they under that weight would look to Christ in his righteousness and forsake any hope in self or this world and follow him. That's the point. And we, we might be tempted to think, well, but that's not really fair. This man hasn't yet seen the crucifixion. He had not heard Paul's commentary on the law, so how could he understand this? This man would have understood through the law and sacrifice that he was unable to keep the law. And so a proper response when Jesus said to him, you just have to keep the law, would have been, woe is me, I am undone, for I cannot keep the law. And I have known this since a young child. 
Woe is me, I am undone. I cannot keep the law even though I try. This would have revealed a true heart which is humbled and a true poor in spirit condition. But what does he say? Look at verse 18. Then he said to him, which ones? Um, all of them? Right? That's, that's the assumed recognition. All of them. We're not talking about you keeping it to the best of your ability and picking the ones you like. This is God who is holy. This is his standard. And you have to keep all of them in order to gain eternal life through doing good things. You have to keep all of the law. James 2 gives us a little commentary. The Lord's half-brother says this in verse 10. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. I just want to be clear again. You will be judged according to the law. And if any man or woman could keep the law perfectly, they would stand righteously before the Lord. But since no person can... Since no person can, because God's standard is a holy standard, we are all condemned by the law. And we are only saved by the Messiah. For whoever keeps the whole, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how much stature and affluence and how much respect you receive from the community, no matter how religious, no matter how sincere, no matter how noble, no matter how humble you are, no matter those things, if you do not clothe yourself in the righteousness of Christ, following Him, you will stand condemned as a lawbreaker before the Holy and perfect judge. Amen. Remember, this answer that our Lord gave is about answering the young man's question. Teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And what this man is revealing is he still doesn't understand his own question. That happens all the time in evangelism. This is a normal thing. He still doesn't understand. He hasn't gotten there yet. Jesus said, God's holy, you know this. But if you want to get there, because God is holy, you just have to keep the commandments. Oh, which ones? Okay, I see you still don't understand. Let me give you some examples. Jesus responds with a sampling. And Jesus said, you should not commit murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's interesting. When you look at these commands, they have this in common. What our Lord chose to give him are the ones dealing with man's relationships to one another. And remember, he's already given commentary in his teaching in Matthew 5 where he explains that the heart is the seat of God's judgment. So if a man looks with lust, he has broken the law. Or if he has anger and hatred for a fellow human created in God's image, then he has broken God's law. He's already given commentary on that. He doesn't need to. He may have given it to this young man. But for we who are reading it, we understand that commentary is given. That truth is established, it's irrevocable, and does not need to be contradicted in this setting. And he gives them this. Listen, to be clear, this should have elicited a response of, woe is me, I am undone. Here we go again. The Lord says, okay, you're not hearing me. (laughs) Let me give you some examples. You have to keep these commandments, these ones that deal with your relationship with others. You know, those other sinners that you come in contact with regular? Listen, I know I have to keep, I have not kept these to God's holy standards. I mean, think about this. Guys, when you look back over your life of relationship that you live, would you honestly say that you are a perfect friend, a perfect citizen, a perfect son or daughter, or a perfect spouse? Anybody? Wise choice. I don't, I don't want to call you. I wouldn't even have to. This should have elicited a quick response because guess what? We live in relationship. We live in conflict due to relationship on a regular basis. Believe me when I tell you, for every time you've had your feelings hurt by someone, you've probably hurt someone else's twice. That's just life. It's who we are. And so this should have elicited a response where this young man goes, oh, 
woe is me, I'm undone. I, I, I can't do that. God is holy, and these are the commandments. I can't do this. This should have brought conviction and a humble response, but did it. Verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? At this point, there should be absolute clarity whether you're Christ or just you sharing the gospel. This person doesn't get it. They still don't understand what it is that brings eternal life. All these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? And we again come to that moment of, um, let me see how to get you to understand this. How, how do I make this clear? Look, young man, you are leaning upon your own righteousness. You are trusting in your own ability. You have not recognized your own unholiness when I reminded you that God is holy and He alone is good. You are so sure of your own righteousness, you don't understand. And Jesus always responds. Let's listen to what He said. This is so important. This is from the account in Mark chapter 2. Hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What we see is the fundamental flaw in this young man's thinking is he believes himself to be righteous. To come unto eternal life, you have to believe yourself to be sinful. We struggle so much with this. We believe that somehow Christianity is about calling us to recognize our goodness. I see this all the time. I preached a men's conference uh, some years ago where I dealt with a lot of men who live in the Bible Belt. And they're good men, men of integrity, men of, of work ethic, men of those things. And I had to explain to them, listen, you cannot be a Christian because you're good. The only person who can truly be a Christian is the one who realizes they are not good. This is the reality of the gospel. This is what the Lord's doing. He didn't come to save those who are righteous. And here's the reality. None are righteous. And so what Jesus is saying is those who are self-righteous, I am not here to save. Those who are sinners, those who are poor in spirit, I came to seek and to save those who are lost, not those who are confident they're on the right track and just want a little boost to keep going the way they're going. That's not the gospel. Those who think themselves well do not visit the doctor, and those who think themselves righteous or good enough will never follow Jesus. Because Jesus calls us to a hard path. And we will never lay down ourselves if we don't see ourselves as the obstacle. We're going to see the difficulty of the path as we go forward, but we recognize this. Listen, I can just picture this scene, Jesus thinking or maybe even saying out loud, you didn't get there when I reminded you that you have to keep the law perfectly. You didn't get there when I used the commands regarding relationships as the means of displaying your inability and unrighteousness. Think about this. Jesus has already offered a summary of the commandments. He's already done this earlier when he says, here's the, here's the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two hang all the others. This is the framework that all the others come hanging upon. <clears throat> so I gave you the second greatest commandment. How are you doing with your relationships? And you didn't get to see, you didn't, I didn't get you to see how far short you're falling. Let's jump to the first greatest one. Let me put this more personally, young man. And again, think of the first greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. In our understanding of this, this is a picture of the seat of all that we are. This is your intellect. This is your, the totality of who you are. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, you shall love the Lord your God. Let me put this more personally to you, young man. Verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. What you lack, young man, is me. You're not seeing what's in front of you. I cannot even present myself to you at this point because you don't see what you lack. I cannot give you the cure because you have not seen the disease. This is not about you getting a shot, 
that helps you with some antibiotics. This is about an amputation that needs to happen. And it's pointless to give you a shot when gangrene is going to kill you anyhow. That's the picture that's being given here. What you lack, young man, is me. You are hoping in your abilities. You are trusting in your nobility. And you are confident in this world and all that it can give you. You have to let go of that. And then you can trust me. You have to let go of that. By the way, again, every evangelistic setting, it might start and have different wording in the sense of who you're speaking to. If you're speaking to someone who has a deep religious background of falsehood, you got to undo a lot of things. If you're speaking to someone who's never heard the gospel, you're building a lot of things. The presentation might have distinctions in the way or where you start or where you take them, but it will never lack this truth. The foundation is God's holiness. The recognition is man's inability. And then it leads to this reality. You have to turn from those things. This is the repentance phase or the repentance call in evangelism. And our Lord displays it so well. You have to turn from the life and things you have hoped in and follow me, young man. That's what the Lord says. Repent from your self-righteousness and your love for possessions. Turn away from them and follow me. This is not new, by the way. This is not an addition of works to faith. It's not a change to the gospel. It's not a, let me deal with this guy differently than I've dealt with the crowds to this point. This is the repentance call that is absolutely essential for evangelism to function. The gospel without repentance is no gospel. And it cannot save. Our Lord displays this in his evangelistic proclamation where he says, look, you're missing it. You got to turn away from all that you have been pursuing and instead pursue me. It's not new. Remember what we addressed earlier regarding time and space and the reality of already made statements being recorded in Matthew's gospel as standing irrevocable? This is just the great trade off. Jesus has already explained it for us. Look at Matthew 16 just quickly, just a few chapters back. We know this. He's explained it to us. He's in the process of explaining it to this rich young ruler. <clears throat> then Jesus said to his disciples, verse 24 of chapter 16, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes, this guy doesn't even want to follow him yet. He has to give him all of it at this point. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? This is the question the young man's asking. What can I give in exchange for my soul? What can I give in exchange? I've I've got many possessions. I I live a noble life. I'm, I'm respected among the people. Surely there's something I can do. There's not. What was this man's, this was this man's hindrance. His hindrance was his hope in his ability and possessions and accomplishments and other things. This happened to be his hindrance. What's yours? That's the question, right? That's, that's where we all have to get. What, what's your hindrance? It may be the same as his. It's a very common one. Maybe different. Think about the examples we have. I love this. I love to consider this picture and these examples. Abraham left his native country at God's command. I know people that would give up all the wealth they have to not have to move to another country. Moses gave up the palace and pleasures to follow God. Paul gave up prominence and pursued as a great rabbi that he'd spent his life going after. Many suffered, and many even died to follow God because all saw him as worthy of their everything when they begin to follow him. It's the simplicity of this statement. Think about this. Jesus is simply upholding this truth, and he's trying to get this man to recognize what he lacks so that he might truly have eternal life, which can only be had through faith in Jesus displayed or evidence and obedience to Jesus. Think about this scenario. We see it far too often. If a person professes faith in Christ, but then let's say that the cost is too great 
And there comes a point in their life where they reject Christ to hang on to whatever is being threatened. Were they truly a Christian? Did they truly have eternal life? That's the question. We had Brother Larry reading earlier from Luke 14 when he says, Look, you better count the cost at the forefront. Or else you will look very foolish on the backside when you can't complete what you started because you didn't count the cost rightly. Jesus is not wasting time with this young man. He brings him to the question at the front, and so too should we. We have a wrong view of the gospel. We have a wrong view of salvation when we think that somehow with enough time and convincing and flattery and and other things, we can get someone there. That will not happen. It does not happen. To give you an easy example, the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we have the account of those who go through the tribulation will face the greatest terror and struggle and suffering this world has ever known. And rather than cry out to God, they crawl in caves and cry out to the rocks above them to fall upon their heads. So suffering and horrible circumstances and those things will not bring salvation. And then we come out of that season and go into the reign of the millennial kingdom here on earth where the wolf and the lamb lay down together and life is good and perfect and Jesus rules from the throne in Jerusalem. And at the conclusion of that, men will reject Jesus in the midst of the greatest peace and prosperity that has ever existed. So it's not suffering and it's not prosperity that brings salvation. It is Christ and faith in him alone. And so we need to understand if a person professes but then walks away, Jesus just skips all that. Think about these scenarios that we see far too often. Imagine a man professing Christ and preaching the gospel. But then it comes out that he has been forsaking Christ and his commands for adulterous pleasure. And he refuses to repent and follow Christ, but instead turns and follows after that pleasure. Was he a Christian? No, he was not. And he's displaying that clearly that when it came to that, he loves these things more than he ever loved Christ. Or if that same man is found to be one who is using the gospel for personal gain and affluence, and when confronted, he refuses to follow Christ and instead follows his wallet. Would we not say, wait a second, here's one to think on maybe even more fully. Think about a missionary who is in a hostile environment preaching the gospel, but suddenly he's confronted with the loss of his freedom. If he doesn't renounce Jesus and preach against the gospel, and so this man publicly renounces Jesus and begins to preach another way to eternal life. Is he a believer? No. And so Jesus, just knowing all of these things, says to him, you got to see it right from the beginning. You have to forsake this world and follow me. It might be 10 years. It might be 20 years into your faith. It might be 30 years or you might not face it to any of these degrees. But there will always come a confrontation at some level on a regular basis where you are confronted. Will I trust Jesus? Do I trust Jesus? Will I follow Jesus or will I follow the world? And here's the reality according to Scripture. If you follow the world and you are not disciplined by God unto repentance, then you are not a legitimate child. And if you do follow the world, and certainly we all have made that choice as believers, God whoops us and through trials and conviction from His Spirit and His Word draws us back into Himself. That is the picture that is given. And so if someone goes into that and rejects Christ and continues in that rejection, we know they were never a believer. And whether they say they reject Christ, we're told in the book of Titus that those who reject Him by their actions equally reject Him. He Listen, Jesus' gospel presentation just cuts right to the chase. And he calls this man to count the cost and to consider him as worthy. And the young man is forced to decide if Jesus is worth this to him. There should be a point in any and all faithful evangelism where the case must be stated plainly. And a choice or decision is demanded. Not by you necessarily, but by the presentation. Jesus has just reached this point. He walked through it and he said, remember who's holy. Remember that you're not. You can't keep this. Okay, you're not getting it. Let me give you some samples for you to realize how much you can't keep it. Okay, you're still not getting it. Let me tell you plainly what's lacking because you asked. Jesus reaches point and we see the grief of the young man's rejection. 
verse 22, but when the young man heard this statement, he, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Charles Spurgeon summarizes this as only his, he can. He says this, this man's great possessions so possessed him that he never possessed his own soul. Let me read that again. This man's great possessions so possessed him that he never possessed his own soul. This is a grievous but honest and faithful outcome to a gospel presentation. One thought that came to me along these lines, due to confusion about evangelism and our own limitations compared to our Lord, some come like this young man with sincerity and humility and acceptance and their true rejection is not revealed until later when they are confronted more fully at that time with the cost. Jesus let this man walk away and he did not change the message and call him back to consider a less than cost. Okay, you don't want to give that up? How about you just give up 50%? There's no bargain deals on the gospel. We would never cheapen the gospel. We must not cheapen the gospel. We must not change the gospel and its demands to fit those with whom we share it. No matter how lovely they are, nor how nobly they start. There is so much more to cover here, but we've got to wrap it up for this morning. And I would be remiss to leave this message about someone other than us. We have to ask ourselves this morning, have we received this gospel that Jesus brought? Did your walk of faith begin with a hopelessness? When, when you looked around at every option that surrounded you, money, pleasure, strength, power, success, health, did you realize none can satisfy? All this will be seen as futile when you consider the question of what comes next. This is a short life, and there is uncertainty for all of us. Surely there has to be more. And if so, what do I do? Was there a beginning point of your walk of faith that you can see that recognition? Maybe not in its fullness, but as a starting point of what led you to this. This world cannot accomplish nor satisfy. I, there has to be more. Did you come to realize that God who created you and will judge you is holy? That the more that has been offered comes through his standards and his alone? Did you believe that you could not and cannot measure up? And rather than anger and greater self-righteousness and arrogance, you have to humble yourself under this truth and trust in Jesus as the righteous one who has given himself to you. Sometimes when presented with the gospel, I've had people get angry over the standards of God. This will show itself in a desperation and yes, fearfulness. There is deserved judgment that every man stands under. There is a fearfulness, a righteous recognition. Hebrews describes it as, as one who is, it comes unto the mountain of God that cannot be shaken. It is a clear description Did you have fearfulness and recognition of deserved judgment? You'll know because it will be a great contrast when that is lifted from you. When you have believed upon Jesus as your Savior and have trusted Him as your Lord. If you're still under the weight of uncertainty and struggle and all of these things, then it is likely that you have not yet trusted this Lord and this Savior. You will know that this has happened truly when you have forsaken hope in yourself or others or this life or this world and you only want to follow Him. Yes, it will be a fragile walk. Yes, it will have stumbles and shortcomings but it is the desire that He has placed within you one that resounds to every fiber of who you are. I want to trust and follow him. What we have here is Matthew has just recorded a 3D illustration 
of what Jesus says in John's gospel, chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Young man, what you lack is me. Turn loose of me and follow Christ. Would you trust me today? Would you turn loose of whatever is the hindrance between you and the cost that Christ brings? Or will you forsake eternal life for this temporary one? That is an option. In the book of Acts, Paul the gospel to his fellow He said these words. He says, you have judged yourself unworthy of eternal life. And so we are now turning to the Gentiles with the good news of the gospel. You can choose to forsake eternal life and live for this one. But I would ask you, what are you afraid to give up? The great trade-off? 80 years, eternal life? You guys got to see this rightly. There's no right-minded financial person who would say that's a bad trade-off. Think about it in these terms for just a moment, if you will. Someone comes to you and says, I want from you or you need to trust me with a million dollars. That's a lot. That is a large sum. It has great value. Make no mistake. It's hard to see past the thought of a million dollars. But they say with clarity... I will give you a trillion for it. Sign me up. How do I get there? And remember, we're not talking about Bernie Madoff. We're talking about Jesus Christ. His promises are sure and steadfast. I promise he is worth whatever you give up. Jesus or this world? Eternal life or temporary life? The choice is yours, and today is the day that you have been called to make it. It's before you. I don't know how to give it more clearly. I don't know how to explain to you what Christ has explained more fully than what you have heard this morning. And if you are hoping in anything other than the pursuit of Christ being displayed in your life because you have trusted him for his righteousness, then you stand condemned. By the law, which you will be judged according to. Would you pray with me? Lord, your gospel is amazing. And your grace is sufficient. Lord, even if there are those here who have rejected you for years and in hypocrisy claimed you, today they can know you as you truly are. There is a cost We forsake this life to become citizens of heaven. Lord, we want to trust you. Lord, help our unbelief. Overcome through your spirit any struggles that remain. Open hearts that have been hardened that they might receive your gospel. They might receive your salvation. Lord, call us who have received it to be renewed in our pursuit of you, to shake the dust of this world and wash it from us through your word, to be renewed in our minds in regards to our salvation and our citizenship and the mission you've given us. Lord, we love you, and we know that you are worth all of it. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.